Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alamin wa salatu lahi wa salamu ala khatamin nabiyyin wa ala alihi tayyibin tahirin wa ala azwajihi wa mahati almu'minin wa ala ashabihi ajma'in wa ala tabi'in wa man tabi'um bi ihsan ila yawmiddin wa alayna wa ala ibadillahi salihin Welcome to all of you coming out uh, today brothers and sisters and also for tho those of you who are watching online uh, thanks for joining in and now on uh, today's uh, uh, program we want to look at uh, what remains from the previous uh, lectures where I announced that we will be dealing with the uh, three aspects of Isa alayhi salam and the Quranic presentation of Isa alayhi salam and now what, what of the three we did two one remains um, and instead of dealing with it last night we had another issue uh, regarding the uh, divider in the in the masjid and uh, now I return to the uh, presentation of Isa alayhi salam in the Quran dealing with that third issue which is uh, the mention in Surah Al-Saf uh, that uh, the Isa alayhi salam was sent Mubashiran bi rasulin yati min ba'dismuhu Ahmed uh, that he was sent uh, as uh, uh, giving a good tiding uh, of the one who would come after him, whose name is Ahmed. So let's look at uh, a few issues here. First of all, Ismuhu Ahmed. Uh, his name is Ahmed. The one that Isa alayhi salam spoke about to come after him, he will have the name Ahmed. Ism in Arabic does not necessarily mean that the person has the, na the name. Uh, but it can have a, a kind of characteristic. It can be that the person has this characteristic. Ahmed uh, in Arabic means uh, more praised or, or most praised. And uh, we know that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has the name Muhammad, which means praised. Uh, and so that description of Isa salam is fitting. Uh, it is not necessarily a name, but in Islamic tradition it came to be accepted that Ahmed is one of the names of our Prophet Muhammad now, did Isa salam speak of uh, a prophet to come after himself? Muslims, in, in trying to appeal to Christians to accept this uh, narrative of the Quran that Isa salam spoke about our Prophet Muhammad wasallam in advance, have pointed to uh, the uh, closing chapters of John's Gospel, where in chapters uh, 14, 15, and 16, uh, Isa salam speaks about another one to come after him. That one is given in some English translations of the Bible as a, a comforter, another comforter, another comforter. In the Greek version, uh, it, it's another parakletos, parakletos in Greek. Parakletos means one who is called or one who calls. Uh, so it would seem to indicate uh, like a human being and a prophet because a prophet is the one who calls people to Allah Azawajal. And at the same time he is called to uh, the uh, office of prophethood to deliver the message of Allah Azawajal. So that seems to gel. But uh, our Christian friends often object and they say, but well, look, in this uh, one of these passages, it says explicitly another paraclete, the, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, it says so in John chapter 14, verse number 26, the Holy Spirit. So then uh, they will say, uh, what Jesus was speaking about is the coming of the Holy Spirit, and they say that the Holy Spirit came into the disciples of Jesus, on whom be peace, on a special day referred to as the day of Pentecost, which occurred some 50 days after Isa alayhi salam uh, was... Uh, resurrected uh, from the dead, well, after the crucifixion event. So he was crucified, they say, at Passover, and then Pentecost occurs uh, 50 days after that. So in the meantime, Isa alayhi salam had been raised up into heaven. So they would say that Muslims are reading too much now into the Gospels by trying to find our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam therein. Uh, we we have uh, on a previous occasion commented on the Gospel of Barnabas, which uh, actually says that Isa alayhi salam spoke of another prophet to come after him and uh, gives the name there as Muhammad. Uh, but I'm not going to give any. Uh, uh, credit to the Gospel of Barnabas in this lecture and in the previous lecture I've indicated some of the difficulties for Muslims to regard that as an authentic gospel and to champion it as such. Uh, so I'm going to leave aside the Gospel of Barnabas for now and I'm going to concentrate on the uh, gospel presentation of Isa salam to see whether it is possible that he spoke of another prophet to come after him. So. 
I want to say that uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow we're starting the uh, Tahajjud prayer uh, in the masjid here and uh, that will keep me a little bit busier than, than usual and uh, will keep many Muslims as well busy with uh, prayers uh, during the night and I guess not only here in Toronto but uh, around the globe as well. So as, as we enter now into the last uh, 10 days of uh, Ramadan, I will ask that uh, you accept that from tomorrow onwards I will reduce the length of this uh, lecture to half an hour. So instead of starting at 8 tomorrow as usual, I will start at 8.30. So starting tomorrow for the rest of Ramadan, I will start this lecture at 8.30 inshallah. So, uh, to continue then, uh, Isa alayhi salam uh, spoke then according to this passage in John's Gospel of another paraclete. Is it necessary for Muslims to find and prove that in the Bible uh, Isa alayhi salam spoke about uh, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi No. Because it is accepted, especially in John's Gospel, it is stated especially uh, that uh, uh, the Gospel does not record everything that Isa alayhi salam said. Uh, the Gospel uh, towards the end says that uh, Jesus said many other things and to record all of this would require all the books of the world. So uh, not everything that Isa salam said is recorded in the Gospels. This is now understood. So th th there are some things which are presented in the Quran about Isa alayhi salam. Isa alayhi salam said this or did this. And these things are not recorded in the Gospels. That's not a problem. Uh, they may be, some of these may be mentioned in other uh, narratives, in, in what uh, may be referred to as apocryphal Gospels. And some may be in, in Gospels that were mm, uh, not yet discovered. So we, we don't necessarily have to find in the Gospels that Christians have today that Isa alayhi salam said this. But I'm still going to look at these passages and see if that could mean anything to do with our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So to look at that more carefully, I want to step back and look at a more general picture. Does the Bible as a whole, even those parts before Isa alayhi salam, say anything about the coming of prophets? Uh, and that could have a bearing on the coming of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The answer to that is yes. In the Old Testament, uh, that is before Isa alayhi salam, we find in the uh, books of Moses, especially in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the uh, fifth book uh, that is said to be the books of Moses, it says in chapter 18 verses uh, number 18 and 19 that uh, God will send another prophet like Moses and uh, uh, you should listen to him. That prophet will not speak of his own, but he will deliver that which he hears. And he will foretell of things to come later. Uh, so a prophet will come like Moses. Now some commentators on the Bible say that what is uh, uh, the point here is not that one specific prophet will come, but that there will be a series of prophets over time. So that whenever there is a need for a prophet, uh, one will come. So if that is the case, then it's not one specific prophet, but a series of prophets. Then we should ask, when does the series end? So who was the last in the series? Or, or are there prophets still coming even today? And uh, nobody seems to, know, to be able to say that a last prophet has come uh, from the Bible itself. Now if we ask, okay, let's go to the Quran. We ask you Muslims, you believe that Muhammad وسلم, is the last of the Prophets, true? You say he's Khatam and Nabiyyin, okay, uh, the seal of the Prophets. So how do you know that? Because the Quran says it. If the Quran didn't say it, how would you know? Okay, you would say the Hadith says it. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is reported to have said, La Nabiya Ba'di, there is no Prophet after me. So you say the Prophet said it, I believe it, that's the end of it, right? Okay. Uh, now, if the Quran didn't say it, and the Prophet ﷺ didn't say it, how would you know that he is the last Prophet? You wouldn't know. And saying that he is the last Prophet, or saying that another Prophet cannot come after him, that would just be guesswork. <coughs> so now let's ask our Christian friends, how do you know that no Prophet can come after Jesus? They can't know. There's no, there's no such clear indication that uh, another prophet uh, uh, cannot come. So there's no last prophet, so one cannot rule out that possibility. What has happened, however, is that 
uh, Christians began to think of Isa salam as being so special that he's beyond prophets. And they had to have a kind of uh, a justification for his coming into the world. They began to think of him as the son of God. And then what was the justification? The justification was, as explained in the Bible, that uh, it, God had sent many prophets over time. And then finally he saw it fit to send his son into the world. So now it would seem like once the sun has come, this is, uh, you know, cancels any need for any further prophets. It's like, uh, let's say that, uh, you know, in, in, in those uh, uh, karate films, like, you know, somebody goes and he battles with somebody in the courtyard, right? He has this uh, real fist fight in the courtyard, and then, like, he knocks that guy down. Then he goes into like the foyer, and then you know he fights some more with a couple of guys. He knocks them down. Then he goes into the inner room, and, like he knocks some guys down. Then what does he deal with last? The Grand Master, right? So once once he deals with the Grand Master, there's no one else left to deal with. You see, this is the the logic of this: that Isa alayhi salam is the son of God according to the uh, New Testament uh, writings. And once he has come, now th there's no need for any other prophet. You see, that's, that's the idea. That he, that this is the, but there's no explicit statement. There's no explicit statement. But we should ask now, uh, is it true that Isa is the son of God? Because to begin with, if he's the son of God in that literal sense in which Christians believe him to be, then our Prophet Muhammad is not true, right? Um, so if we are asking the question, uh, is it possible that Isa spoke of another prophet, we are starting from the point of view that Isa was a man, a human being, a servant of God, God's Messiah, God's uh, messenger, and uh, a prophet like previous prophets before. We're starting with that. If somebody says, no, let's start with the uh, understanding that he's the son of God, and then that person gets into what is called circular reasoning. Circular reasoning, where they assume, you see, if you're going to uh, prove a point, you can assume something uh, that uh, by assuming it, you already answer the question. By assuming that Isa a.s. is the son of God, you already say that Muhammad a.s. is a false prophet. So you can't start by assuming that. If we assume that, we wouldn't be having a debate, we wouldn't be having a discussion. Circular reasoning is committed, and, and most people understand that to be, when you assume the conclusion. Like, for example, in many books dealing with logic, they will give you this as an example. They will say, uh, somebody says, the Bible is the Word of God. So we ask the person, how do you know the Bible is the Word of God? He says, uh, because the Bible says so. So, how do you know, well, why should you believe it? Just because it says so. He says, because it is the Word of God. You see what happens now? He started out by saying it's the Word of God. He ended up by saying it's the Word of God. He hasn't really proved anything. He's gone in a circle, right? In other words, uh, he, he has assumed the very thing which he was supposed to prove. He's supposed to prove the Bible is the Word of God, but now he starts to assert that the Bible is the Word of God without proving it. So this is called circular reasoning. When you assume the very thing that you're supposed to prove, uh, circular reasoning occurs when you assume something else which is so close to the conclusion that you're supposed to arrive at, that if you start with that from the beginning, there's no need for the whole exercise in thinking. So that's, that's also circular reasoning. So, in short, if somebody starts by assuming that Isa a.s. is the son of God, then he has decided in his own mind already, Muhammad a.s. is a false prophet. So the case is closed. For us to open the case and really examine it, are we asking our Christian friends to consider as a possibility that Muhammad is a true prophet of God and that Isa spoke of him to come afterwards. So if you're going to consider this as a possibility and disprove it on other grounds, then you can't start with the ground that Isa is the son of God because that case closes the case right away. Okay, so starting with the understanding that Isa is a prophet and servant and messenger of God, we're leaving aside the question of the Son of God. We're not deciding that yet. We're going to come back to that. That's a later. That's another discussion. We're, we're, we're neither affirming it nor discounting it. 
But we're affirming the other titles which we have in common between Muslims and Christians. Isa alayhi salam is a prophet, a servant of God. Christians do not deny that, that he's a servant of God. At least they say as a human being, when he came on earth, he was a servant of God. God's Messiah. Uh, and so we're affirming these. Now, when Isa alayhi salam spoke then, we want to see whether it's possible that he spoke of another one of a similar nature to come after him. And this is what we need to see. So, uh, Isa alayhi salam then, did he say that uh, all, that's the end of all prophethood? No other prophet will come after him. No. In fact, it is mentioned that Isa alayhi salam spoke uh, of uh, false prophets to come. And, and he said that this is how you distinguish the true from the false. Because by their fruits you will know them. So the one who does not bear good fruit, or the one who bears bad fruit, you will know that this is a false prophet. So if he's giving you the criterion to recognize who is a true prophet and who is a false prophet, then you know that it's open as a possibility that true prophets will come. Let us now jump back to the uh, Islamic situation. Islamic situation is that Muslims believe that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is a false prophet. What does that mean? Anyone who comes after the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and claims to be a prophet, by definition he is a false prophet. True? You don't have to know, okay, um, how tall will, will he be for us to know that he's a, tall, he's a false prophet? If, he, you know, if he's uh, uh, shorter than, than five feet, then he's a false prophet? You, you need to know that? No. Because automatically, he's a false prophet, right? Uh, does he have to be born in a certain place for us to know he's a false prophet? No. So there's no need for any description. Um, last prophet has come, everyone else automatically not a true prophet. So when Isa is giving you a criterion by which to differentiate between the true and the false prophets in the future, that means that there might be true prophets. Okay? Not even just one, maybe just many. Uh, and Allah knows best. But at least, there has to be at least one. In logic, we differentiate between all, some, and none. So all, some, uh, and, and, and none. All on one extreme, none on the other extreme, some in the middle. And some, uh, in, in logical definitions, can be one. Okay? Even though in, normally we use the sum to mean uh, to mean uh, like few at least, right? Um, um, in every day. But in logic, some can have the meaning of one uh, as a distinction between all and none. Because these are two exclusive categories. All, everything, none, nothing. Some can be at least one. Okay? So Isa alayhi salam speaking then uh, of uh, false prophets and giving the uh, criterion by which to recognize the false prophets uh, leaves open the possibility that at least one prophet will come. Now in, in the New Testament uh, writings in the Christian uh, Bible uh, we have a mention of prophets after Isa salam. They're not prophets of the scale uh, that, that Muslims are expecting our Prophet Muhammad salam, or understanding our Prophet Muhammad salam, to be, uh, but they are nevertheless called prophets. They're called prophets. And what that means, uh, it seems, that at the very basic level, uh, is that we're referring to people who had some ability to foretell some events. So they may be warning somebody, you know, don't go into there because some disaster will strike you there. Something of this nature. These are people who are understood to be somehow guided by God and they are called prophets in the New Testament. And they're after Isa alayhi salam. So that means after Isa alayhi salam, uh, there are other prophets recognized in the New Testament. So let's say that these are prophets but of a lesser kind. In the Old Testament there are many prophets, some are called major prophets, some are called minor prophets. So let's say these are a kind of minor prophet. Okay, so th but there are prophets after Isa alayhi salam. So then, we are back to our original question, uh, who is the last prophet according to the Bible? There is no such person that could be identified as the last prophet. If that person could have been identified as the last prophet, then, and then, by some explicit statement, then it could have been said, okay, the Bible is closed, no more prophets, that's the end of the matter. But now, it's not the end of the matter. So now there is a possibility of further prophets. Now, in the Gospel according to John, there is the interesting uh, episode that before uh, Jesus, salam, 
there was John the Baptist preaching. Now we're not talking, we're talking about two Johns now. John, the writer of the Gospel, so we call it the Gospel according to John, said to be the writer of the Gospel in any case. Nowadays, that uh, authorship is another question, uh, and a disputed question. Uh, but now I'm referring to Yahya salam, who is called in English John, and he's called John the Baptist, more accurately John the Baptizer, uh, because he was baptizing people, which means he was washing them in the River Jordan uh, to wash away their sins. Muslims make ghusl and make wudu, and we understand that when we make wudu, uh, ablutions before prayer, all of our sins are washed away. Uh, so, uh, in a similar way, uh, uh, Yahya salam, was baptizing people. He was washing them in the Jordan River, uh, and that was for the remission of their sins. So, he came to be called John the Baptizer. And more popularly, he's called the Baptist. Uh, so that's Yahya alayhi salam. Yahya alayhi salam, as you know from the Quran, he was there before Isa alayhi salam. Uh, and uh, also contemporary, but he was born before Isa alayhi salam. His story is told first in the in Surah Maryam and also in Surah Ali Imran. Uh, and in the Gospel as well, he's shown to have been uh, six months older than Isa alayhi salam. But when they were on the scene in public preaching, they were together uh, on some occasions. So on one occasion, it is said that uh, people came to John the Baptist and they asked him, Why are you doing everything that you're doing? Are you Elijah? Because they expected that a previous prophet named Elijah whom some people have tried to identify as the prophet uh, uh, um, Idris. Idris. Some say he might be Elias, prophet Elias from the Quran. So we don't know, that's not an answered question. But in any case, there's a prophet in the Bible known as Elijah. And Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind, it says, and so he, he didn't die on this earth. He was taken up into heaven. So now there was an expectation in Jewish history that Elijah will come back. Just as he was taken up, he will come back. And now people are coming to John the Baptist, to Yahya and they're asking him, Are you Elijah? They want to know if Elijah has come back and you are the God, you are the one. So he said, No. They asked him, Are you the Christ? And he said, No. Then they asked him, are you that prophet? Are you that prophet? So that means that between speaker and listener, if we say, if we say that, we are, you know, we, we mean like a specific one. That means between speaker and uh, between well, questioner and questionee, there is a mutual understanding here that they know what they're talking about. They're talking about a specific prophet. Are you that prophet? And he said, no. So, so that's the, the question now. Who is that prophet? In the Gospels, it is shown that Isa salam came up to John the Baptist to be washed as well. And what this indicates for historians is that uh, John the Baptist had some kind of superiority over Isa salam because by definition like if you have to go to somebody to receive some special blessing then he's got one over you right but uh, uh, Christian writers of the New Testament they did not seem to like this feature of the gospel story so they try to deal with this in different ways. So if you go from one gospel to another, you line them up according to the age in which they were written. You see that the earliest of the four gospels, the gospel according to Mark, has it just as a stark fact that Jesus went to be baptized also as people were being baptized for the remission of their sins. Well, that, of course, raises the question, did Jesus have sins? Did he go there to get his sins washed away? If he didn't have sins, why did he go to get his sins washed away? These are questions now. Now, in Christian thinking, Isa alayhi salam is the sinless son of God. So, uh, that, that's the, the way later and developed idea that he's the sinless son of God. So now they have to deal with this. Uh, if you say he's the sinless son of God, why did he go to get baptized when everybody was going to get washed for their sins? So that, that the first gospel leaves this now as a question now to be answered. 
So what do the later Gospels do? They try in some way to minimize the impact of this story. That seems to be like the earlier story, and now the later uh, Gospels are trying to rewrite the story. So that it's not so like striking that Isa alayhi salam goes and gets baptized uh, for the remission of his sins. So one of the Gospels, the Gospel according to Matthew, uh, does it in his way. What does he do? He has it that when Jesus went, went to be baptized, John the Baptist like stopped him and said, uh, I need to be baptized by you. Why are you coming to me? So now this solves the question, right? This, this solves the problem and answers the question. John the Baptist himself has admitted that Isa is superior to John the Baptist. And then he goes on, that Isa answered him and said, Let it be so for now, so that all things might be fulfilled. So that means now, yeah, Isa is agreeing with John the Baptist. Yeah, I know I am superior to you. Um, but uh, let this continue. We are going through some formalities here because uh, some requirements have to be fulfilled. So we're just going through this formality. You see? So that's now how Matthew has revised the story to make it look now uh, as if John the Baptist is not superior to Jesus. So historians now, like J.K. Eliot in his book, Questioning Christian Origins, are quite clear that this is a revision of the story. The original story has it that Isa salam went up to be baptized for the forgiveness of his sins, as recorded in Mark's Gospel. This proved to be a problem for the later Gospel writers, and they're trying to reshape the story. In a similar way, the commentary on this passage in Matthew's Gospel, in the New Jerome Biblical Commentary on the Bible, admits the same thing that Matthew here has revised the story to get over uh, what uh, scholars are referring to uh, as the embarrassment uh, over the fact that, that John the Baptist baptized Jesus as he was baptizing other people for the forgiveness of their sins. John's Gospel. John's Gospel is the last of the four and often takes uh, the picture of Jesus to greater heights than the previous Gospels do. So here too, regarding this episode, John uh, has got to do something about this one as well. When I say John, I don't mean the actual disciple of Jesus. I mean like an imaginary figure who is the writer of John's Gospel. So I'm speaking here in an impersonal matter, manner, but I'm giving the writer a, a name. And, and uh, speaking as though we know who the person is, right? So I can make it longer by saying whoever wrote the gospel according to John uh, had to do something. But I'm making it shorter by saying John, all right? So, so John had to do something about this because he wants Jesus to appear big and great. Like, like out of this world. And uh, so it's not going to fit very well to have him being, uh, appear to be lower than John the Baptist. So John's Gospel has it now that when Jesus came where, Jesus, where John the Baptist was already baptizing people, John the Baptist called out, Behold, the Son of God who takes away the sin of the world. So in this Gospel, Jesus doesn't even go to be baptized. It's as if John is busy doing this work with other people. He's washing them for the forgiveness of their sins. He sees, John in the, he sees Jesus in the distance and he calls out, Behold, the Son of God. So he's telling people, Look, Son of God is here. So that solves the problem in a different way. Of course, when these Gospels were written, they were circulated in different areas. So the same people were not reading all four. Because now that you're reading all four, you wonder why is it like that there and not like that here. Now you're doing that because eventually uh, when these four Gospels were popular for their own reasons in different areas, uh, then somebody saw it fit to bring them all together into the same uh, one volume. That's how it eventually emerged into the same one volume. Now we can check and compare them. But the earliest readers could not compare. So the writers are writing for their own readership and trying to convince them in the way that they wanted. John wants to convince people that Jesus is like out of this world, he's great, son of God in a literal manner. And so uh, the stories are developed further to make Jesus look bigger and greater than he actually was. So definitely bigger and greater than John the Baptist. 
to the extent that John the Baptist calls out about him saying that he is the son of God. He's the lamb, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So then we have it according to these narratives that John the Baptist is superior to Jesus. However, the original story shows that John the Baptist had one up over on Jesus because Jesus had to go to him to receive that blessing, to receive the baptism for, which was the baptism for, the remission of sins. And that's what historians accept. That was the original story. Now that historians accept that, and we know that, now discounting all of the uh, attempts to make Jesus look superior to John the Baptist, now let's come to a statement of John the Baptist as mentioned in the Gospels. That John the Baptist said, After me will come one greater than I, so great that I am not fit to stoop down and untie his shoelaces. After John the Baptist will come one greater than John the Baptist. Okay, so now let's put two and two together. We've already proven that John the Baptist from the Bible, one would have to conclude that John the Baptist was superior to Jesus. True? We've just proved that. I'm not asking about what Muslims believe. I'm just talking about like if a Christian has to evaluate this, how should the Christian view Muhammad wasallam? The Christian wants to search his or her Bible to find out, is it possible that this Bible says anything about the possibility of Muhammad wasallam coming as a prophet from God? So the Christian has to say now, uh, given that what we know about the four Gospels and the way they have developed the story and the way they try to prove that John the Baptist is superior to, uh, that Jesus is superior to John the Baptist, and we know that the original story shows that John the Baptist was superior to Jesus. Uh, this is now how the thinking has to proceed. So we have proven from the Bible and uh, looking at the history that uh, uh, historians will accept now that John the Baptist had one up over on Jesus. So John the Baptist is greater than Jesus. True? According to the Bible. So if John the Baptist is greater than Jesus, and John the Baptist is saying that after me will come one who is greater than I am. So could that one be Jesus? No. For two reasons. One is that it's already established that John the Baptist is greater than Jesus. And John the Baptist is speaking about one to come after him who is greater still. So if A is greater than B and B is greater than C, then definitely A is greater than C, right? And, uh, you know, if, if I say A is for Ahmed, and, and B is for the Baptist, and, and C is for Christ, then here is our ABC. So, if Ahmed is greater than the Baptist, and the Baptist is greater than the Christ, then Ahmed is greater than the Christ, and, and greater than John the Baptist, right? It's, it's, it's like ABC. It's, it's very clear that the one to come after John the Baptist, whose name we now know to be Ahmed, uh, it, that he is greater than John the Baptist and greater than the Christ. So it's not equal to the Christ. You can't say A is greater than B and B is greater than C, therefore A is equal to C. Or C equals A. No, it doesn't work that way. A greater than B, B greater than C, therefore A is greater than C. And not equal to C. So you, one cannot say that Jesus is the one who John the Baptist was speaking about. That's the first reason. The second reason we cannot say that Jesus is the one whom John the Baptist was speaking about is because John the Baptist is now uh, saying, after me will come. And, and Jesus and John the Baptist were contemporary. They were there on the scene at the same time. And uh, it, it is clear to scholars that uh, they were operating at the same time as well gaining followers, different followers at the same time. Some of the Gospel writers try to make it seem that uh, John the Baptist does his work and then he's removed from the scene and then Jesus comes and starts his work. But no, the, the fact of the matter is, for, to historians is that John the Baptist and Jesus continued to have like parallel missions at the same time. At the same time. So it's not after. Jesus is not after John the Baptist, but contemporaneous with him and simultaneous with him. So John the Baptist is speaking of somebody greater than himself to come after him. 
And that could not be Jesus Islam. That obviously to Muslims is the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. So now we must go further and, uh, and look back again at the statements of Isa salam that after him will come a, another one uh, who the Christians say that is the Holy Spirit. So now we want to ask, uh, was the Holy Spirit not already there? In some of the statements Jesus is saying it is imperative that I go away. For if I do not go away, then this paraclete cannot come. So who, if this paraclete is the Holy Spirit, so that means Jesus is saying it is imperative that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit cannot come. So what's, what's the problem? Like the Holy Spirit and Jesus cannot be there at the same time? Is that a problem? Well, the Holy Spirit was there before Jesus. And the Holy Spirit was always around, it seems. So, what do you mean the Holy Spirit cannot come if Jesus does not go away? In the Gospels, it is clear that Zachariah was full of the Holy Spirit. And uh, other persons, they had the Holy Spirit. So, for Jesus to say, it is imperative that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit cannot come, would make no sense. But if by paraclete, Isa salam is referring to another sequence to come in a series of prophets, another prophet to come in a sequence of prophets, then yeah, one has to go before the other one comes. Now it makes sense. If Isa salam in speaking of another paraclete is speaking about another prophet to come, then he is consoling his disciples by saying, look, you guys are worried because I'm going away. But that's the story of life. It is imperative that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the much awaited prophet, he cannot come. So let it be so. I'm going away, but that's not the end of the story. Another prophet has come. And in fact, I have to go for the other prophet to come. This is what you say to console uh, people who are, who are distressed at the moment. And Isa alayhi salam was saying it the, the right way here. Uh, so, in, in short, it is clear so far from our discussion that Isa salam was speaking about another prophet to come after him and, uh, and that prophet we know to be our Prophet Muhammad wasallam. I want to go now deeper. This term paraclete, as I've said, can mean one who is called or one who calls. And in fact, when we look at the meaning of the word Nabi, in both Arabic and Hebrew, and especially in Hebrew because I've consulted the works of uh, scholars on this. Uh, Anderson, for example, in his book, The Old Testament, uh, which is a, a textbook that is studied in universities, uh, it says quite clearly that a, a prophet is, an, is a spokesman for God and he is one who is called. John Hayes, in his book, Introduction to the Bible, in a similar way, uh, de defines prophet as one who is called. So, uh, when, when we look at all of these uh, bits of information, we see that the word paraclete in Greek is obviously referring to another, uh, to a prophet. And when Isa salam spoke about another paraclete to come after him, he's speaking about another prophet. Now it seems that uh, when Isa salam left the scene, people wanted to think of Isa salam as the be all and end all. So they didn't want to think of him as having spoken about another prophet to come after him. And stories emerged in this way uh, to develop after him. The stories developed, his sayings themselves were reported from one person to another by word of mouth until they were transformed. And uh, transformed in different lines of transmission. So the saying like picks up speed in one direction, picks up speed in another direction. So in, in one direction in particular, or, or we can say in some of the sayings as, as they develop, uh, now we have variations from one from another. So there are, in, in John's Gospel, in these chapters that we refer to in chapters 14, 15, and 16, five individual sayings that have been identified by Christian scholars. Five individual sayings. Two in John chapter 14, one in John chapter 15, and two in John chapter 16. 
Now when you look at the sayings individually, they give different emphases. We've already looked at one in John chapter 14, verse number 26, which says the paraclete, the Holy Spirit. So our Christian friends hang on to that one and they say, look, you Muslims are wrong. Jesus was speaking about the Holy Spirit, not about another human person. So we say, okay, leave that one aside for the moment. Okay, that's one of the sayings, the way it developed in a particular direction. Okay, let's go to John chapter uh, 16 and look at verses number 12 and forward. So we're looking at one of the statements here. In this statement, Jesus salam, speaks about the, not, uh, the other paraclete who is to come, who will speak what he hears. And he will announce to the world and he will convict them. So these descriptions are descriptions of a prophet. Where did we hear previously about one who will speak what he hears? That was already in the Old Testament. Remember, we started with that from the book of Moses, about a prophet to come, another prophet like Moses, who will speak what he hears. And here Jesus is speaking about another paraclete to come, who will speak what he hears. And how does the Quran describe our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, at the beginning of the 53rd chapter, Surah Al-Najm? وَمَا يَنْتِكُ عَنِ الْهَوَى He does not speak of his own desire. It is only a revelation that is revealed into him. So he speaks what is revealed to him, what he hears. So our Prophet وسلم, fits that description. Now, what accounts for this difference? Why is it that in one saying of Isa alayhi salam, it's clearly stated the Holy Spirit, and Christians are right, they have a good point there. You Muslims are wrong. In this statement, it says the Holy Spirit. Can't you see? Like, why are you so determined to read that this is the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and it clearly says the Holy Spirit. But now we want to ask our Christian friends, okay, look at John chapter 16. And let's find out why these two statements are different. Why is it that in John chapter 16, it seems that Jesus is speaking about another human being, a prophet. Now, it's not only Muslims that have recognized this. According to Raymond Brown in his uh, two-volume commentary on the Gospel according to John, and I have the second volume here in the Anchor Bible, uh, scholars before him uh, have, uh, identif have said that that one that Jesus was speaking about, this paraclete person, uh, is, is another human being. If there is, for example, Hans Windisch, who goes into great length about this and, and insists that Jesus was speaking about another human being. So if Jesus was speaking about another human being, let's see what has happened there. Now, it looks like Jesus spoke about another human being to come after him, but his statement was being transmitted in different lines. There are different lines of transmission. This happens with the hadith of our Prophet ﷺ as well. A hadith goes through different lines of transmission. One person reports to another who reports to another who reports to another. Uh, uh, one person reports to another who reports to another to, who reports to another. So, by the time the hadith ends up in, in this direction and ends up in that direction, it becomes two different statements. Okay. So now, imagine Isa salam, said something about someone to come after himself. Now it ends up in two different directions. In one direction, it's another human being and a prophet. In another direction, it's the Holy Spirit. Now we want to know which of these two is the correct direction. According to Raymond Brown, uh, though he's a great scholar and I respect him for his scholarship, and he's well known and respected throughout the world, there's no doubt about that. I think he's wrong on this point. But this is what he says, this is how, how he tries to reconcile this. He says that uh, John wanted to present the Holy Spirit as coming in a new way. And that's why he coined this term, paraclete, to refer to this Holy Spirit and, and, and in a way, this Holy Spirit is Jesus himself coming back. And to give that new meaning, John coined this new term, paraclete. It makes no sense. Because the term itself has become so problematic for uh, Christian writers and commentators that normally they have to break the commentary just to deal with this term as a term that is so puzzling. Sometimes the whole book is written just on this term alone. And, and it's not that the term is rich in meaning, it's that the term is so confusing to them. Why this term? So now, I, I, let, let's look at it a different way. 
Suppose Isa alayhi salam, and this is my solution. Uh, suppose Isa alayhi salam spoke about the Holy Spirit to come after him. Now the story develops in one direction and continues to retain the Holy Spirit. It de de develops in another direction and people have made that into another prophet. Why would anyone make it into another prophet? Think about Christian history. The German scholars say you have to understand it sits in Leben, uh, the, the circumstance in which the stories developed in the, in the early Christian history. So the early Christian history is like this, that uh, people believe that they have the Holy Spirit in them and they don't need anything more. The Holy Spirit has come, we are filled with the Spirit, we are fine, we go about, we preach the Gospel. Now, why would they, in that situation, why would they come up with a, with a saying of Jesus to say that another prophet will come? In a situation in which they already feel they have everything. Jesus has come, Son of God, we have the Holy Spirit, we're going about preaching. So why would they invent a saying of Jesus, saying that another prophet will come? They wouldn't. Okay, so let's go back then. So we're retracing now, we're considering all our possibilities. Suppose Isa spoke about another prophet to come after him. So now the story naturally gets transmitted from one person to another and it continues and it remains that it's another, per, another prophet who is called the Paraclete, right? Another prophet, one para, called Paraclete, who is one who is called or one who calls. So that story remains the same now. Why would somebody now change it in the other line of transmission to make it the Holy Spirit? Now you see why. Because First of all, they don't want another prophet to come now. They feel that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the end of the matter. He has come. We don't need another prophet, right? Secondly, we have the Holy Spirit. So let's have it that Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will come. All of this is not like as deliberate as, as it may now sound that I'm making it out to be. I don't mean it that way. I, I'm, the, the, the way in which a story develops and grows is often gradual and subconscious. People uh, think the story must be like this, and then they report it like that. So what a person thinks to be true, he reports it as, as if it is true. And if somebody th thinks that something is true, they attribute it back to Jesus Islam because they think that all truth must have originated from Him. So whatever they know to be true, they attribute it back to Jesus Salam. So they attribute to him that he said that the Holy Spirit will come. But there's no good reason for thinking that when he was speaking about the paraclete to come after him, that that paraclete referred to the Holy Spirit. We have already seen that uh, he said it is imperative for, that I go. If I do not go, the paraclete cannot come. Uh, that makes sense if we are talking about a series of prophets. One goes, another comes. If we are talking about the Holy Spirit, it makes no sense that Jesus has to go for the Holy Spirit to come. Because the Holy Spirit was already there. When we look at the descriptions of the paraclete, this is one of the reasons why scholars have written so many uh, uh, tracts and volumes about this. It's because the, the descriptions of the paraclete are descriptions of a human person. He does the kinds of things that it would take a human being to do, and not the Holy Spirit. So in that case, they have difficulty showing how the Holy Spirit could have been the paraclete. Then, in short, and, and to conclude now, we can say that the Quran spoke about Isa salam announcing ahead of time that after him another one will come whose name is Ahmed, another prophet. مُمُبَشُّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدِ uh, giving a uh, glad, glad tidings of a Rasul to come after me whose name is Ahmed. And, uh, if we take that to be a, a statement that uh, Isa alayhi salam uttered and we look for it in the Gospels, first of all we don't have to find it in the Gospels, it may not be there, but in this case we do find that Isa alayhi salam said something which seems to indicate another prophet, that's in John chapter 16 and uh, this is one statement uh, among five 
in which Jesus Salaam, speaks about another person to come after him who is called the paraclete. In one of the statements in John chapter 14 verse 26 it says explicitly the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, but we can see today that uh, Jesus was not speaking about the Holy Spirit. In fact some Christian scholars have, have said that the term the Holy Spirit in that verse is actually not original as well. And they said that uh, when uh, the, uh, the, the, the gospel was transmitted, somebody must have inserted that term, the Holy Spirit, there. Uh, C.K. Barrett, for example, in his go in commentary on John's gospel, uh, has said this. So, it's not that Muslims are inventing things and trying to read things into the gospels and make it somehow say that uh, the gospels refer to our Prophet Muhammad wasallam. This is what emerges from an academic study of the New Testament. So now, when we have come this far, remember we suspended judgment on the question of whether or not Jesus is the Son of God. Because we said if we had assumed that from the beginning, uh, then it would mean that our Prophet Muhammad Wasallam didn't know that he is the Son of God. And that would mean our Prophet Muhammad Wasallam is not a true prophet. So we suspended that for the sake of the discussion so that we do not commit the fallacy of circular reasoning. But now that we have come this far and we have shown that Isa salam was speaking of another prophet to come after him and that our Prophet Muhammad fits that description, now we can return to that question and we can say that this true prophet of God who has come as a fulfillment of the previous prophecies, prophecy about a prophet to come like Moses, prophecy about the one to come after Isa salam, prophecy about the one who was greater than John the Baptist, to come after John the Baptist, and obviously by extension and by, by implication also greater than Jesus, that prophet has come. And now he has announced that God does not have a son. And therefore that Jesus salam, though being a, a mighty messenger of God, a prophet and, and messenger and God's Messiah, he is not the son of God. And we recognize that by virtue of now the message that has been delivered through the last of all of God's uh, prophets, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. We may have time for one question and I want to announce in advance that uh, as we're entering now into the last 10 nights of Ramadan, tomorrow night we're going to start the uh, Tahajjud prayer here uh, to to conserve our energies and dedicate it towards the worship which is special to these last uh, 10 nights. Tomorrow's lecture, uh, starting tomorrow, I'm going to condense this lecture to half an hour. So instead of starting at 8 o'clock tomorrow, I will start at 8.30 inshallah and that will be for the remainder of uh, Ramadan. So the usual uh, pre-Maghrib lecture will be only for half an hour starting at 8.30 tomorrow inshallah. Okay, so any questions, anything from the internet? There's a brother that exists. Is there any sect of Christianity that specifically denied the authority of the four apostles? A question, is there any sect of Christianity that explicitly denies the authority of the four Gospels? Um, I don't know of any sect nowadays that, that denies the four Gospels, but there have been some earlier uh, sects and, and followings uh, that uh, did not accept some of the Gospels. Like one man by the name of Marcion, who many Christians, of course, all Christians today virtually are, let me stick with many, many Christians today will say that Marcion is not a true Christian, but in any case, he falls within in Christian history, he had a particular view of Christianity and uh, he only wanted the gospel according to Luke and the truncated one at that uh, and, and not the other uh, gospels. So there, there, there were early Christian sects who had different gospels than the ones that now are found in the Christian Bible. But I'm not aware that anyone explicitly rejects the four gospels as we have them now. There's one more question. Yes, one more question. Brothers asking, did the translators deliberately say Prince of the World instead of uh, Paraclete because they knew it would be referring to Prophet Muhammad? Mm, uh, did the translators deliberately translate the way they did uh, instead of saying paraclete uh, because they thought it would refer to the Prophet Muhammad mm, uh, I, I don't think they necessarily deliberately did that. They came within a milieu in which, uh, you know, when, when the Bible was first translated hundreds of years ago, people had very little knowledge of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam in Europe. And, and so when they translated the Bible, they, they translated it from within the uh, parameters of Christian thinking. So to them, 
time it was referring to the Holy Spirit. Jesus spoke about the Holy Spirit, so they referred to it that way. They translated paraclete as uh, comforter because they thought that that's what uh, it meant. The Holy Spirit w somehow comforts Christians. Uh, but, uh, but nowadays, cr Christian scholars say comforter is not an, a fitting description or, or translation for paraclete. And uh, they prefer usually to just leave the word un untranslated because whatever translation you give, it's always problematic. So that's part of what I've said. How, why did John invent this term paraclete to, to be problematic? He didn't invent it, I would say. It looks like this is something that went back before John. It's a statement about reported from Jesus, whether authentic or not, but still early. And when John is looking at this statement, John wants to uh, give it his own particular slant. So he returned the statement, but he tried to give it his own meaning. And now we're seeing that, that the meaning does not gel in the two lines of development of that uh, narrative uh, of Jesus' statement. And the, the only way to make good sense of this is to say that Isa salam, spoke about another prophet to come after him, and that prophet is Muhammad salam. But some people, uh, in transmitting the statement of Isa salam, in some versions, uh, they made it seem like Jesus was speaking about the Holy Spirit or a spirit that is called the spirit of truth that somehow dwells inside of the disciples of, of Jesus. Uh, because they had that belief and they made the statement of Isa alayhi salam conform to that belief which they had. So I think that's about all the time we have, right? We have to break, uh, unfortunately, so that we can break our fast here in Toronto. Brothers and sisters, thank you all for tuning in via, in, via internet. Thank you here for coming out. Uh, and uh, let's uh, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our fasting on all of our good deeds. Starting tomorrow, inshallah, the lecture will begin at 8.30 and that's for the rest of uh, Ramadan. The 10 o'clock lecture will remain as usual. Jazakum Allah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The topic, um, Brother Ray wants to put the topic in, right? Which is a good idea. You give a little more search. Uh, yeah. So, um, the topic for this one would be what? Uh,